was uh, to introduce the topic of risk-based supervision uh, and the setting for the, the conference over the next couple of days. Uh, and the main items I want to cover on the agenda are, first of all, uh, what the purpose of uh, risk-based supervision is, the, the objective. Uh, secondly, why this might be relevant for the uh, health sector. And then thirdly, some experiences we have from other countries which uh, we think might be useful going forward. So first of all, uh, to look at the question of uh, the aim of risk-based supervision, uh, when I travel to different countries, uh, it's often the case that people say, well, look, we want to introduce risk-based supervision. And my question to them is, well, what do you mean by risk-based supervision? And uh, so first of all, I wanted to share with you three uh, myths about risk-based supervision uh, so that we know one thing that risk-based supervision is not. Uh, first of all, uh, some people say, well, look, we're going to implement risk-based supervision in, uh, in a short period of time. So, in other words, it, it's a project that finishes and that's all there is to it. Uh, as we'll see, uh, whilst there's work required to, to implement risk-based supervision, it's an ongoing process. It's not a, a necessarily a sort of short-term thing that you do that starts and ends. Uh, secondly, uh, at least some people have said that the effect to risk-based supervision is that we can have more cost-effective supervision, meaning that we might end up with less supervisory staff. Uh, usually that's not the result, and we'll see why that is the case in, in a little while. Uh, the third possible uh, myth that I wanted to share with you was a, a concept that uh, tended to exist more before the financial crisis, uh, that you could have supervision that would be somehow sort of a light touch. Uh, and uh, light touch supervision has gone out of fashion after the global financial crisis. But uh, risk-based supervision doesn't necessarily mean uh, a light touch. Uh, it may mean less supervisory intensity, we would say, in some, in some ways, uh, but not necessarily light touch. Okay, so let's look at the, the reasons that are often advocated for risk-based supervision. And the first one, uh, from the point of view of the superintendency, uh, I would suggest is that it enables the, the supervisors to concentrate on the most significant risks that, uh, that they have to address. Uh, so they can focus their resources at, in, in the area of those risks rather than having to deal more generally with a whole lot of work that isn't actually critical to their objectives. The second advantage is that they can then uh, identify and mitigate those risks and uh, that gives them a, a really good opportunity to, to, um, to realise uh, their, their advantages in, in the risk-based approach. Uh, for supervised identities, there's also an advantage uh, and that's particularly uh, particularly to recognise how they contribute to the objectives of the system rather than simply how they might comply with the uh, regulation itself. Uh, and in the case of, um, of Colombia, the movement to risk-based supervision has also been recognised as part of the national policy objectives for the sector. So the work that's been going on and is continuing is very much part of that sort of national objective, uh, national plan. If we look at uh, particularly perhaps a little bit more about what risk-based supervision is, uh, I think it's important to recognise that uh, risk-based supervision is a, a model that really has um, uh, is contrasted with a sort of compliance-based 
supervision. Uh, with risk-based supervision, the supervisor needs to, uh, to look at the supervised entities and how they identify risk, how they monitor that risk, and how they mitigate their risks. So this is the main focus of concentration of the supervisory action in a risk-based approach. Then, having made this the examination, they evaluate those risks and they respond uh, in terms of their supervisory uh, uh, action and priorities, reflecting how these different risks are, uh, are being treated and how they're being evaluated. So the, the risk assessment is core to the risk-based supervision approach. So this is one of the reasons why the, uh, the resourcing issue is not really uh, as I said before, simply a matter of reducing resources, it's more a matter of focusing resources uh, and getting the right sort of attention that's needed. So if you can look at those a little bit perhaps in these two models, that compliance-based supervision is an approach where you look at the regulation, you assess whether or not the uh, supervised entity is meeting the law. This is a decision that's either a yes or a no decision. And usually the, the, the law and the regulations define what action should be taken if the, there isn't compliance. So uh, it makes a basic assumption if you want to say, well, are we achieving the objectives? that the law itself sets out uh, all of the necessary requirements to respond to risks in the, in the current environment. Now, usually that's an assumption that's difficult to, to achieve, uh, and that's why we often see uh, a continual desire to update or, or modernise laws or reflect current circumstances or some level of concern both in the uh, the uh, sort of official level or also with regulated entities where they say, look, this situation doesn't, uh, doesn't fit very well with what the law requires. So in most countries, the law is always a little bit out of date when it comes to more, uh, current activities. So this assumption is, is, a, is a brave assumption. Now, if we look at supervision based on risk, on the other hand, uh, the supervisor performs this risk assessment, uh, looking at the risks, looking at the importance of those risks to the system and to the entities that are part of that system. Uh, and it then responds to the supervisor reaction based on that risk assessment. So you can see that the assessment itself is no longer a straightforward yes or no kind of decision. Uh, it's much more of a graduated kind of approach. So that requires a whole stack of tools, uh, a good understanding of different categories of risk, uh, and a, the ability to uh, form assessments of those risks and match those against the, uh, the supervisory response. It also, uh, which is important, we'll come to in the next couple of slides, it also moves to a situation where the entities themselves uh, are recognised as the managers of risks. So there's a, a basic assumption that managers are doing their job in a competent and prudent way. Uh, now, that assumption is core to the risk-based supervisory approach. And again, we'll come back to how that tends to be then reflected. So just looking at that in a little more detail about the sorts of things that the supervisor has to do, it, on the left-hand side in the box, it talks about what the supervisor is doing. They need to evaluate different levels of risk. They need to uh, evaluate how different entities within the system contribute to those risks, how different activities within the system uh, contribute to those risks and how these risks come from different sources and directions and then tailor the regulatory requirements and the supervisory intervention 
based on that level of a risk assessment. So they need to have things like a classification of uh, risk ratings for entities. They need to have what's usually described as an early warning system, uh, which effectively is a system of the, the rating and that much more forward-looking assessments, really. They need to collect the right kind of information. Usually in a compliance-based environment, you're collecting information to see whether or not the entities are complying with the rules. In a risk-based approach, there may be some information that you need to collect about risk, not purely about, uh, about compliance. Uh, and they need to have a, a, a manual of intervention uh, showing how they would be intervening progressively as the uh, as the risk levels change. Uh, so these are just some examples of what the supervisor needs to have in terms of their enhanced toolkit. For the entities themselves, uh, the new environment of a risk-based approach uh, is over a, a sort of a positive and a uh, more um, energetic, let's say, more intensive side. In particular, on the positive side, the supervisor is, is in a situation that says they're going to recognise the risk and the risk management of the entity. So if you improve your risk management, then the supervisory intensity will reduce. So there's, there's a payoff, in a sense, for the investment. The supervisors only concentrate on the big problems and effectively this is the same thing that senior management will be doing. So there's a much more even conversation between the supervisors and the senior managers in institutions. And that means that you move from this arms length sort of uh, police legalistic kind of approach to a much more collaborative uh, engagement. It, it also means, though, that managers will get a reward for good management, but that means they actually have to do good management. And uh, so that to be able to do that internally is one thing to be able to, to demonstrate that to an external party, such as the supervisor, is, is a different issue. So it may well be that some of the procedures and policies and such have to be um, polished up a little bit too to stand up to that sort of outside scrutiny. But I think what I wanted to emphasize as well is that the implementation process is, is really not a matter of uh, a start or a finish. It tends to be a continuum. We move from a risk-based approach to a, uh, from a rules-based approach to a risk-based approach. Uh, it doesn't mean we drop the rules straight away or, uh, or such, it's a, it's a progression. Uh, it's usually a very long-term uh, transition. And it tends to require a lot of investment in technical skills and development of procedures, both in the supervisory authority, but also to some extent in the entity that a change in the mindset uh, that uh, that we bring to the task for both the supervisor and for the uh, supervised entities. So if we look now at the health sector, uh, one of the interesting things we have to look at uh, is to consider exactly what risk we are concerned about. And uh, we have had discussions over the last year about this, and I think this is one of the most interesting parts of the, uh, the initiative that's underway, uh, to look at the different uh, levels of risk against the objectives that we're trying to achieve, which are particularly the objectives for the system and the objectives for the supervisor. And the result of that is that we've looked at objectives which talk about the delivery of services. Uh, obviously, that's an important aspect of the system, ultimately. Uh, it's not just about delivering those services, but delivering them at a, at a level of quality. Uh, uh, and it's also not just about delivering a quality, which, of course, could be done at any cost, but that there needs to be a, a reasonable cost 
in, in doing so. So there's a, a concept of cost effectiveness as part of refocusing as much, uh, although we can't eliminate entirely, but we wouldn't be focusing as much on activities and issues which are not so critical to the delivery of those, those objectives. Now let's look a little bit at the international experience. And I, I first of all picked a couple of early risk-based supervision adopters, uh, and these are the financial sector supervisors in Canada and Australia. Uh, just to give you a couple of lessons. So the first one is that in the Canadian case, although they've been doing this for a very long time, 1985, they actually started and then went back and started all over again five years later. Uh, so they felt that they didn't get the, the structure right, uh, the, the important cultural changes, and they went back and reworked that. So, uh, so it's a good example that some of the early lessons that, that have been learned are ones that, that everyone else has been able to learn from. But it also says, well, it's not so easy. Uh, and in, even today, the Canadians would say we haven't fully implemented risk-based supervision. We're still going through continually refining and updating and improving with the work that we're doing. Uh, so I think that's important. Uh, but the other thing is that they have moved from this uh, regulatory rules-based approach to an approach now where they pretty much uh, focus their attention on uh, the governance of the entity. They say, we, what we expect as an, uh, an institution is well managed. We expect that um, different entities will be doing different things, but, uh, but they'll be doing that in a prudent and effective way. In Australia, they also uh, did some restructuring. They faced a particular challenge in terms of uh, the retraining of staff, uh, which was a big issue there, and I think that highlights the importance of, uh, of training that's required, really, in terms of moving to this new environment. Uh, and uh, so the uh, the uh, lessons that they learned, really, uh, was that they had to, I think, come to more of a uh, moderated approach as they went along. And they also had quite a large number of entities similar to the challenge that uh, we faced in Colombia. Uh, so they had to align. They had some experience here also from uh, Germany, from Chile. Uh, and just in terms of what this experience has, has taught us, I think one of the important things is that in, in the German case, for example, uh, this uh, supervisory activity has a focus uh, to, to a fair extent on the financial risks. Uh, and you'll see again on the next slide as well, the, um, the Dutch case and the Swiss case. Nevertheless, they do have some elements of the, the health outcomes, uh, but perhaps the one which had the greatest impact that we saw in terms of the, the challenges that are similar to those in Colombia was the Chilean case, where you can see they have a series of risks that they're looking at, but the, the entity was established quite specifically as part of the health law reform process and so it's not surprising that it has specific attention to the same kinds of issues uh, and I think that's probably one important element from the international experience is that depending on exactly which entity has been given the task of carrying forward the objectives does depend a little bit on how risk-based supervision tends to develop in those, uh, in those countries. So I just wanted to then perhaps highlight one last point about uh, how it, risk and supervision is a, um, is a process. Uh, and I use 
this analogy of growing um, a tomato plants in a in a, a in a pot. Uh, normally, you would have some kind of stake to hold up the tomato plant, and we might consider that the stake is a little bit like the rules in a rules-based supervisory environment. So, if you were to remove the stake uh, and just say, "Well, we're now going to rely on the plant itself," then it's true that a lot of that would normally just fall down. Uh, and the same sort of thing happens in a, in a risk-based supervisory environment. But if we rely on the rules, uh, which we have so, uh, so under a rules-based approach, then if you can't just take away the rules because people don't keep have in place the risk management techniques and practices that, that, that they need. Now, of course, some do. But for most organisations, it's not uh, either necessary or economically reasonable to develop uh, risk management to that level. Uh, so they tend to have some need to, to strengthen their risk management and governance. Uh, because now they're going to get a, a benefit, an economic benefit from doing so. Whereas under the rules-based system, you can invest as much as you like in that. It doesn't make any difference to the, uh, the regulatory response. For the supervisor, it means that they have to really do a lot of work on this issue of assessing risk and information in the work that they do internally. And then when they come and visit, it means that they have to move from uh, continually looking at uh, documents and doing compliance type checks to discussing with senior management what uh, they're actually doing. So I described this that they, they really move from the file room to the boardroom in that sense. Uh, and that of course it also requires a different uh, skill set and, uh, and approach on both sides of the table. Uh, but it also means that as I say this the the strength of the pot plant uh, comes from developing, in the, in the supervised entity case, developing risk, risk management systems and internal controls to a stronger level. So that when we take the state away, the plant can still stand. Uh, and it also reflects the conditions in the market itself. So when we compare how risk-based supervision is implemented in different countries, it's worth bearing in mind that each company has their own features, including uh, different numbers of supervised entities, uh, a different range of uh, uh, risk management constraints, including the accounting system, the data, the information that they might have, as well as technical capacity, uh, the uh, access to people with the relevant technical skills, and the nature of the risks themselves are different. I mean, whilst it's instructive to look at what different countries do, uh, every system has its own features, its own products, the assets that are on the balance sheet have their own uh, characteristics. So all of these things need to be reflected in the, the any risk-based approach that's taken in each different country. So we really learn from each other in terms of our high level principles and approaches and experiences, but we have to always bear in mind that we need to adjust it to local circumstances. So just to conclude, uh, I think this then means that what I'm wanting to emphasize is that moving to a risk-based approach is not a, an overnight or a short-term exercise, it's a, a step-by-step -step journey. Uh, you tend to start, of course, with the first step, uh, and that's always an important step to take, but the, uh, the ongoing nature of the journey is, is very important. Uh, eventually, it will require changes, possibly to uh, the actual regulations themselves to provide the necessary flexibility, uh, but also to the technical skills, both in the supervisor and, um, and in uh, supervised entities. Uh, but over time, things strengthen and uh, the, the real benefits of focusing the regulation much more on the economic uh, justification of what we're trying to do 
and also to achieve the actual outcomes of the system is, uh, is where the real benefit lies. So I'll conclude my presentation there and I think there's a facility where we could take a couple of questions if we have time. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you so much, Greg, for your uh, very interesting presentation and so glad that you we managed to have you with us today, notwithstanding the, the problem with your, uh, with your flight. So, as we said earlier, we we're going to give you some questions and I'm going to start with a question from my side, waiting from the one that I've been collecting from the audience. Uh, so, obviously, you highlighted that uh, this is a the introduction to a risk-based supervision process and uh, you highlighted that it's a, it's a long process and not an easy one. And I was wondering if you, from your experience, from uh, your experience as a supervisor in, uh, in Australia or from providing technical assistance to various countries and sectors, you can help us to identify some example of the growing pain in, of the risk-based supervision, for instance, uh, whether related to the information system or human resources, or also with a relationship with the supervised entities. So maybe if you can provide us with uh, some example from your experience. Thank you. I think um, uh, particularly the issue of um, challenges and IT systems and such, uh, one of the biggest issues uh, if we contrast the compliance-based approach and also uh, uh, sort of a pure uh, business approach uh, is that the IT systems tend to be very good at producing accounting type information which is backward looking over a relatively short period. Uh, but they're not very good at supporting the kind of information you might need uh, to make forward-looking assessments of risk. Now, um, entities that are doing more risk management will have already faced this challenge. Uh, the need to make existing data that, that you have more ripply available and able to be analysed uh, is, is a big challenge. Uh, the second issue is that uh, in some cases we just don't have the kind of data at all. Uh, so, so you need to make estimates and gradually collect this data and refine it. Uh, and that can also be about making sure that the IT systems reasonably retain that information for long enough periods of time. Uh, so that would be, the, I think, two of the main areas. But the, the third one would be how risk controls are actually implemented. And I think as people develop their risk management systems, they want to, uh, they want to use their IT to uh, put in place the internal controls that reflect those risks, rather than internal controls that reflect the rules. Uh, so that means that they tend to want to refine their IT systems in terms of the support for the internal control. But these are all, uh, in a sense, sensible things that you would do from a, from a risk management perspective. Uh, and, uh, and they are things that tend to take time. I mean, you can't just uh, expect that uh, by adopting a slightly different system, we certainly have a whole lot of extra data. Uh, we, we have what we have is the capacity to gather that data, but then still over time the data itself actually gets generated. So these are bigger, the kinds of areas. Uh, usually, I would say, when we go back to the point that uh, risk-based supervision is a journey, uh, when you take the first step, you don't have a whole lot of data. You just have some information, and some information is better than no information. Uh, and then it builds going forward like that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank 